This is my history, World War II history project. I'm here with Mr. Robert Hay. So how did you get into, the, into World War II? How did I get into World War II? Yes. They drafted me. <laughs> no, they let me finish school and then, then I went into service. See, I graduated in, in June of 43, and in July I was in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. What training did you get there? What training did I get? Well, they taught me all about communications. That's what my major was in communications. And then I went, you want to know where I went from there? Yes. I went to Colorado Springs to Camp Carson, Colorado. And I ended up in the pack artillery. Mules. If you read the story in the paper about Babe, my favorite mule and so when we got there the guys looked around and he said we well, don't know anything about mules well buddy you're going to learn it so we did and i had the one of mine that boy she was she was what we called a strawberry roll you know with the red and all that mixture well she you know, cried my eyes off the day they put that on the train Sent me down to Fort Benning, Georgia. Bro. So, what you learn in Fort Benning, Georgia? Well, I was in communication, so being the mule, we strung combat wire. We had special saddles on our with adapters, and you had three spools of combat wire. You had one on each side of the mule and then one on top, which was your, you know, your extra. So that's what we did. And then I'd go out in the mountains and set up uh, golf phones, switchboards, and all that kind of stuff. That's what I did. Well, would you go back to training? At Camp Carson? Yeah. Well, we went out to California. And we went up to Hearst Ranch. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but it's one of the biggest attractions in Oregon, California. He was that millionaire newspaper man, remember? He had three swimming pools and everything. And a lot of the westerns were done up there. You know, because of the train and everything, it worked out perfect for John Wayne and those guys to do their western shows. Then the day that my mule ran away, some jackass threw a firecracker behind me. Called him. We had got we had mules that got over the bank and down in the village. They'd like to find out who did it. But she grabbed me and just pulled me down on the bank, down on the side of the bank, and, and I just watched them go by. That's all. She saved my life, you know. Well, every morning I get up and I look out my tent flap down towards where she was, you know, tied, and she let out that mule noise, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know. And she knew it and then she saw me, you know. I didn't have any, didn't have any sugar, but I had some of the hard candy. Remember the hard candy you got in the sea rations? I used to give her that. She loved that. So after you finished your training, what did you, when did you go after that? Where did I go after? I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, okay? They put us in the, into uh, Jeeps. We had a string of wire with Jeeps. You know, big spools on the Jeeps. And then I volunteered to go overseas and I went to Oahu in Hawaii. And then after I had my training over there, I was in the 325th Searchlight Radar Battalion. And then I went from there, I went to Oahu. We got training over there, and then I went to Okinawa for the 10th time. Then General Butler got killed, our general. He goes up by Naha, which was the capital of, you know, Okinawa. 
there and he sticks his head up, they tell you not to stick your head up and he got shot right between the eyes. And they brought off General Stilwell from Guadalcanal. He took over the 10th Army. Yeah. What was it like on the day you had to invade Okinawa? What's it like? Yeah, what's it like? Well, you went on those landing barges, you've seen them. Mm -hmm. and then you get in as close to the shore as you can and then you run through the water with your rifle in your hand, you know? So that's part of it. I was on Okinawa and I was on guard one night. This was kind of cute. And uh, I just pulled my stem, you know, and the other guy went out and placed me. And all of a sudden, he said, ah. he opened up with a machine gun. He had a gun. I said, what the hell's the matter? He says, Jack just rode through there on horseback. And it was in a meadow, you know, with a brook or creek, whatever. So I get back alert, you know, and figure we're going to get hit by anything anytime, you know. You know what the hell's coming. When the sun comes up in the morning, there lays a farmer's dead, dead white cow, black and white cow. He shot the damn farmer's cow. <laughs> I told the captain, put him back in the kitchen. I don't want him with me. <laughs> Shoots everything he sees. <laughs> I, uh, so did you see a lot of combat in an hour? Oh. I didn't run out and shoot everybody on that. Yeah, yeah, we when we hit the southern end of the island, we had them fight the Japanese, but most of them had gone inland. So we wanted to get our uh, radar and searchlights set up on the southern end of the island, and then when we track in the Japanese fire planes, uh, the radar would pick up the fire plane, and then we'd throw on a switch. And the great big searchlights would come up and light up that whole sky. And then the guys that were with us, the anti aircraft batteries, they started firing the Japanese. We all worked together. So. Yeah, so. When I came back home, thank God. This is open on the only place you served your duty. Was there a, uh, no, that's the only one. Okay. I had Okinawa on Easter Sunday, uh, 1945. So, Lord, I'm almost over by the way. Yeah, 46 of Japs. Yeah. That was, I didn't realize it, but they said that was one of the biggest battles on the Pacific. I didn't get that. Did you hear about Tokyo Road, though? Oh, we heard about her. Yeah. Yeah, how she tried to trick the guys. Yeah. I had a girl here. Now she's down in the hospital. She was born on Okinawa. Yeah. And she used to tell me all about how they would leave her out of the So. But she got a job down in the hospital. Was all the They're looking for a lot of help. What was your reaction when uh, the war was declared over here in Okinawa? What was my reaction? Well, I think I was just as excited as everybody else. And then when Stillwell took over, we liked him better than we did uh, Butler. You see, Stilwell was a four-star general, Butler was a two-star general. Then we got hit by a typhoon at 46, 82 mile an hour wind. <laughs> Terrible few tents. That was something. Where'd you go after the war was over? Well, I got on the boat to come back home. And a guy came up to me and he says, Bob, where are you from? 
in New York. Do you recognize my accent? I said, well, up in the Adirondacks. I didn't tell him where. He said, well, I'm from uh, Newburgh, New York, and my wife took a lady's place in the English class, and she's having a baby. I said, wait a minute, I'll go down and get a picture. This is the truth, it's hard to believe it, but I'll go down to my duffel bag and bring you a picture of what she said. Well, here was his wife, this fleet, and this stem rat skiing right at my garage in Warrensburg. Can you imagine? 9,000 miles from home and you see somebody skiing at your garage? <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Oh, I bet. I think one of the biggest thrills for me was when I met uh, Richard Dawes. Did you ever follow history? Uh, yes. Huh? Yeah. Remember, uh, I'll think of his name in a minute. President. Uh, I'll get it. When I met Richard Dawes, he wrote the song, I'll be, or the song, uh, It's All in the Game. You remember that song? Many a tear has to fall. So, he was there with Mr. Head. Mr. Head was my boss at camera store. And so he called me up, Mr. Head, and he said, uh, Mr. Dawes is going to stay with me during the reunion. And he said, uh, I get a chance, I'll right. have you come up and I'll introduce you to him. So he called me up and I went up. And he had a great big Lowry organ, Mr. Head. He loved to play the organ and I'd sing. So he said to Mr. Dawes, he said, you know, Bob and I, I play that on the organ and Bob sings it. And, and the guy said, well, oh, give me a sample, you know. This is the truth. So I sang it and Mr. Head played the organ. When we got through, uh, Mr. Head come over and he said, now I'd like you to meet Richard Dawes, or, uh, yeah, Richard Dawes, Vice President of the United States, under Coolidge. <laughs> so I say for the Vice President of the United States, how's that? It's pretty amazing. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Tell about things that's happened. Anything more you want to know? What career did you pursue after World War II? World War II. After World War II, I uh, I went to college, Jessica College. I went out there two years, 47 and 48. And then the Pirates signed me to a professional baseball contract in 1949. You know what I got for a bonus? 3500 What about that, those kids got, you know? But that was a lot of money back then, you know? And then I went from there. The Pittsburgh didn't have a farm club up in the border league, so they sent me up to Kingston, Ontario to work with the Red Sox farm system. And then the Pirates paid my salary, you know, but I got the experience with the Red Sox. Then the next year I was with Gloversville, the Canadian American. My last two years, I was in Kingston, North Carolina, in the Class B, Carolina. And then I fell on my shoulder, and that was the end of my baseball. Because I was about 27 years old, and you know, they're looking for young kids now, they're not looking for me. So I came back home. I had one of our tanks that was busted. Up. It had broken down, the tread was busted off. And I was out walking around in the wood, you know, on the hills looking for snipers. And all of a sudden somebody shot at me and I ran like hell. And I saw this puddle of water, and I thought it was just a puddle of water, but it was a, a shell hole. <laughs> I went right in up to here. But I got behind the damn tank and then I started firing back to the hillside and I didn't hear them. Do you have any more encounters with the Japanese? Huh? Do you have any more encounters with the Japanese? No. No. 
just, you know, with the air, with their airplanes, you know, my radar, we had plenty with that. That radar would pick those fire flames up. You ever try to shoot at the radar? Well, I ever tried to shoot. The Japanese ever tried to oh, shoot? Oh, yeah. They, they had a place in, uh, I'll think the name of that part of the uh, open up. Cherry Castle. It was a big gorge, and one of those Japanese zeros came right down the, right down the light. Oh, wow. Going to blow up our light, you know. And all of a sudden, the guy thought real quick, and he turned the light off, and that guy, the guy went right down in that gorge and shared the castle and blew all the hell. Oh, wow. You know? Uh, yeah. No. Anything more? Uh, anything you like to add? Huh? Anything you like to add? Anything I want to add? Yeah. Well, uh, let's see. I told you about the typhoon. We had a friend, a little skirmish one day. Uh, the war was over. We had one of these, General Wallace, his name was. And he came on our place, you know. And he started chewing the curtain. Chewing the general up, General Stillman. Now this guy's a two-star general, and he's chewing out a four-star general. The, uh, you know, all these guys are saying, watch when the old man boils. You know, you should have 29s coming in from Guam, bringing in new equipment, and all this stuff. You know, and even, finally, Mr. Stillman said, uh, can I ask you a question, General Wallace? And the general said, sure. He said, how many stars have you got on your shoulder? <laughs> he says, two, sir. He says, well, take a good look at mine. I got four. I think I should be telling you what the hell to do, not you telling me what to do. <laughs> and he says, now, where, where are you going from here? And the guy says, I don't know. But he says, well, you better get in your Jeep and get going. That's all I got to tell you. <laughs> oh, man, we still will just could, you could talk to him, just like you and I are talking. One of the nicest generals I ever met. You know, right down to earth. He'd get in there when we were tearing those tents that we lost in the thing. You know, we had great big platforms that we put the tents on. And we'd clean all that canvas off and all that stuff. And he'd be right there watching us. Yeah. One heck of a nice general. Now, was it Okinawa used as a base for the B-29s to, yeah. to attack Japan? Yeah. Yeah. You see a lot of those? Yeah. Up around Naha, they had a great big air base up there. And that's where uh, Stillwell was having the equipment brought in from Guam to land up in Naha. Yeah. Anything else like that? Well, this side of Talking about the war, right? Yeah. I don't think so. Does that help you? Yeah. Can I ask a question real quick? Uh, sure. What was uh, your rank? PFC. Private first class. Yep. So, um, you had direct contact with uh, the general? Yeah. And that was regular? Yeah, he was there, you know, helping us clean up the place. And you could talk to him, that's all. Yeah. He was one hell of a nice guy. I met another general, General Rolf, when I was out of jungle training in, in Hawaii. And I used to run what they called a, a chicken wire bridge. You ever see him? So, like a V shape, and yeah. you turn onto the wires and walk down the wire? Yeah. And then I pull a rope and dump it in a creek, you know. <laughs> so I, General Rolf come out. He said, Bob, he said, would you do me a favor? And I said, what's that, sir? He said, I want to stay here in your, in your guard shack. So we got a bunch of uh, bull breakers coming in from the state. And we want to put them in their place. So I said, I'd like to have you I'll give you a signal and you pull the rope when we get these officers on that thing and dump them. I dumped 
Out of that water came a kind of bull kind. You son of a so-and-so, I'll have you court martial. I'm Colonel so-and-so. And all of a sudden, the old man walked right out of that shack, and he walked right over to the water, and he says, Colonel, if I was you, I would take my feet and get moving. <laughs> but I didn't know if he was going to stick, uh, stick up for me, you know? Yep. Makes you wonder, boy. That was quite a thing. Any other questions? Anything, 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 anything else like that? Well, I can tell you other things that's happened to me. Uh, it wouldn't be with the service. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you know uh, a guy over in uh, Greenwich. His name was Kim Gannon. You know where the school is in Greenwich? Yeah. And you go down that street back in the school and there's that great big brick house there. <laughs> I know the area, I don't he know. He owns that. But he wrote the song, I'll be home for Christmas. And I went over and met him. You know, we got to be good friends. I have a song I'm working on right now called uh, One Yellow Rose for Julie. There's a story about a little Italian man was working on a railroad and all by himself, you know, and all of a sudden he gets a letter in the mail and he said, uh, we're sending my, your granddaughter to you and you're going to have to bring her up because the mother and father is dead. So he was so happy to have her as a companion. You know. And then every night, he'd come up from down there where the tracks were, and she'd be standing on top of the hill. See? And, uh, and then they'd walk home together holding hands, you know. And it was a great comradeship. So then one night, he came up early, and she wasn't on the top of the hill. So he heard a commotion down by the tracks. So he looked down there, and there was all these people standing around. So he walked back down. Well, when he got towards the people, they just opened up, you know. And he saw his granddaughter laying there dead. She'd gotten hit by the train. She'd gone down, trying to meet him down there, you know. Uh, and the story goes on that uh, he buries her at the foot of the hill in the cemetery, and then he puts one big yellow rose on her. Right. The name of the song is One Yellow Rose for Julie. Working on that. Is there anything else you like to add? No, I can't think of anything. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for telling us. Your story was for what you. I feel a little better since I got up. Maybe I just needed to get up out of bed. Let's see if I can go out now and walk 1,020 feet. But boy, this morning I didn't feel good.